What the scariest true story you know? I grew up in a funeral home. I helped out in the office. When I was about 15, we got a call from a man whose wife and infant baby had been murdered in cold blood. There were very few clues. It made headlines. Cops set up surveillance at the viewing. It was heartbreaking. As the mother was holding the baby in her arms, I was asked to take the flower cards and periodically get the husband and ask if he recognized the names. I then photocopied them and put them back. I did it because I was a kid. People knew me and I was unobtrusive. I talked to the husband quite a bit. He seemed devastated and shaken. The cops told me they had an eyewitness to someone leaving the house the day of the murder. The witness was a 3 year old girl. She recognized the man leaving. It was the husband's best friend. Turns out that the friend and the husband had made a pact to kill each other's for mother in laws and run off with their secretaries. The little girl identified the friend. And I guess one of them cracked. They both went to jail on multiple counts. All on the testimony of a 3 year old. I still cannot believe to this day that that man stood right beside me. Multiple times. And I had no clue. I don't think I ever looked at life the same way after that. Edit thanks for the awards. But the wholesome award. LOL. What the duck. And a few comments above there was someone's grandma who witnessed. As 3 yo. Her mom being murdered from a woman and her dad married the woman who killed her mother. Living with her mother's killer in the same house and no one believed her. My great aunt woke up in the middle of the night. She heard her dog making these low growls. She was single at the time and living alone in her ranch style home. She walked out to her living room to check things out. She didn't see or hear anything out of the ordinary. So she decided to make sure her door and front windows were locked. Door was locked. First window she checked was locked. When she lifted the mini blind on the second window. It was wide open and a guy in a ski mask was standing there. She said he laughed this evil laugh and said party time then he started to climb in. She screamed that she had a gun. Her dog started barking his head off. The would-be rapist decided to bolt. My aunt did get a gun after that and learned how to use it. I can't even think about what would have happened to her if she didn't have her dog to warn her. James Bulger. He was just 2 years old and with his mom running errands. She let go of his hand to pay the cashier and he wandered away. Two 10 year old boys spotted him, lured him toward them, took him by the hands and led him away. They took him to a remote location, pushing and kicking at him the whole time. Some people questioned the two kids with the crying toddler, but they lied saying he was their brother and nobody intervened further. They took him to a secluded spot and tortured him. I don't want to recount the torture details. It's just too gruesome. They left his body on some railroad tracks hoping that being run over by a train would make it look like an accident. He was found days later, his body severed in half by a train. The boys were caught and became the youngest convicted murderers in British history. Security footage from the day they took James shows them watching children, picking out a target, and they were just kids themselves. They were released at 18. One of them is back in jail for possessing child abuse photos on his computer. The most terrifying thing about this for me is that my own son is only 2 now, and James's murderers were just children. Two. It was premeditated and intentional and entirely random. Just a moment a relapse in attention and he became a target of two murderous children. Children. To think that children younger than my stepson are capable of such a thing. Ugh. Everything about this case is just horrifying. Everything to do with Haj Mohammed Mesfui Link. He was a shoemaker who lived in Morocco in the late 19th and early 20th century. He and his accomplice. A 70 year old woman called Anna used to drug and kill young women who came to the shop. Eventually one of the victim's parents traced her movements to the shop. And after the remains of 36 mutilated corpses were discovered nearby Mesfui and Anna were questioned and tortured. Anna didn't survive. But Mesfui confessed to murdering them. Usually for a tiny amount of money. His initial sentence was crucifixion a very unusual punishment even then. However there were many protests from powerful foreign embassies. And Morocco couldn't do much against them. Instead he was sentenced to beheading. A more common punishment. However the mood in Marrakech was that this was far too lenient. So they settled on immurement being walled up alive. 
a special cell was constructed in the wall of the bazaar, about 2 multiply 2 multiply 6 feet. Chains were attached to one wall to ensure he would be kept standing. Masfui wasn't told of his fate until the morning of his execution, when he was led, screaming, in chains and slowly bricked up inside. Once the last course had been laid the crowd would fall silent until he started screaming. When they would cheer, he screamed nearly constantly for two days. On the third day he fell silent. Damn that's a real life cask of a Montelado right there. Copied from Wikipedia. Dangal Rasalate the 19th of May 1983 the 10th of January 2000 was a Lithuanian girl who was sold as a sex slave in Sweden in late 1999. Her mother had abandoned her when she was 14 years old and left for the USA when she was 15, 16 years old. She was sent from Lithuania by an older man who pretended to be her boyfriend. He promised her a job as a berry picker in Sweden and gave her a fake passport. When she arrived in Sweden, a man welcomed her and locked her in an apartment in Malm. He said she had to pay him 20,000 krona for her passport and the transportation from Lithuania to Sweden. She soon understood she would be working as a prostitute. Rasselate was forced to work as a prostitute for two weeks before she escaped the apartment she was imprisoned in. On the 7th of January 2000, she jumped off a bridge in Marne. After escaping from the apartment and getting raped by a group of men who pretended they would help her, she died three days later at a hospital. Her case stirred much debate on human trafficking. My dad worked in a Morgan during college in the 60s. One time on the night shift he was training a recent hire who was wheeling a body down the hallway. The body was under a sheet but all of a sudden started to sit up. The guy immediately freaked out, ran out the doors and quit. Apparently a dead body can have muscle contractions and the abs causing it to start sitting up. The more you know I guess. During college, I lived in an apartment with a community pool. There were a bunch of us having beers at the pool one night over summer term, and one of my friends ran to jump in the pool, but changed his mind at the last second. His feet slipped out from under him on the wet concrete and he went down. He broke his neck in the edge of the pool, never walked again, and had extremely limited upper body function. I watched someone's life be ruined and it was terrifying. Listen to the lifeguard and walk. The scariest true story I know is my own. I grew up with a very mentally ill and abusive father. The summer I was 16 and my younger brother was 13. My father shot my brother with a shot gun at almost point blank range in our basement. Thankfully, it missed his heart by 2 inches and he is still alive today. I came home that evening to find my stepmother cleaning the blood off the tile floor like there was nothing to see. It was the most terrifying and surreal thing I've ever experienced. One would believe attempted murder would be enough to terminate custody rights. But alas the police chalked it up to accidental and my brother and I were too frightened of our father to say otherwise. At 18 and 15, respectively, my brother and I packed up and left the state never to speak to our father again. To this day, little bits of shrapnel still surface in my brother's chest. Edit thank you to everyone who took time to read, comment and upvote. This is not something I regularly share with people. I appreciate all the kindness. I had a guy tell me a story a couple decades ago about how he was hiking in an area in South America and wandered away from other hikers in the area. The ground was wet and without warning it gave away and he got sucked into a fast moving underground river pitch black. Completely submerged and at the mercy of the current as it buffeted him against the sides of the tunnel. After some time the current subsided and he realized he was in a larger pocket. Still pitch black and submerged. He said that even as he struggled to hold his breath. He didn't panic and realized that the water had to keep moving somewhere. So he moved around until he found another tunnel that sucked him in. At one point he began to see light. So he punched upwards, broke through the ground and pulled himself out. Soaking wet, gasping for air and a bit of a distance from the other dry hikers, who were somewhat bewildered when they saw him straggling up to them. I served a short stint as a fireman. There was a RTA call one morning. 30 minutes after I started my shift this guy got boned while driving home after a night of heavy drinking. He got boned on the passenger's side when he ran a red light. His wife died instantly and he pretty much remained unharmed. When we arrived at the scene, 
he was outside his car, while the wife was still seated in the passenger seat. Her lower body was still in her seat, while her upper torso splayed over to the driver's side. Looks like she was just reaching over to the driver's side to open the door. Just that she's unconscious and non-reactive. No blood at all from what we can see from the driver's side. The passenger's door was caved in badly. The driver was still tipsy and thought nothing of what's happening. Kept asking us to hurry up and extract his wife so that they can head back home. Laughing and fumbling around with the police. When the paramedics realized that there was no pulse, we tried extracting her from the driver's side and we realized that her lower left body, her left pelvis to her thigh, was completely crushed and she was impaled through her left abdomen by a piece of the door. When we told him that his wife has died, probably bled out minutes after the impact, you could see the disbelief stop kidding me slowly morphing into realization then ending up as desperate or he was immediately sober and ran over to the driver's side, tried to pull his wife out. It tore her wound up and we had to drag him out. He then proceeded to the passenger side and tried to pry the cave door open. We left the scene then and let the police handle the aftermath. Saw it on the news that afternoon. The new London school explosion. A school in Texas in 1937 tried to tap into natural gas on their own and it ended up leaking and blowing up the school. It's the reason they make natural gas scented in Texas and probably the US now. I'm amazed I never heard of this in school because it seems like something that should be taught. I read some survivor stories and I had ducking nightmares. It was horrible. Three in particular stuck with me. One was a 7 or 8 year old girl. She saw her best friend and playmate with her entire body crushed by concrete with only her shoulders and head above it and she still had a lollipop in her mouth, like she didn't know what happened. Another was a guy I think a 16, 17 year old, helping you ending people and bring them out of the wreckage. He saw a dad holding his daughter crying his eyes out, while the back of the girl's head was broken open with her brain on the ground next to her. The last was a 9 ish year old girl who went to find her mom. After it happened there was a PTA meeting going on at the time so there was a lot of parents at the scene her mom was freaking out trying to find her, but didn't even recognize her. She went up to her mom and called out to her, but she just kept saying you're not my daughter. She was so covered in blood and ashen tears that her own mother couldn't recognize her. It was a truly horrifying thing. I live next to a murderer. Face Wetlick was 6 years old when she was kidnapped out of her front yard. It was all over the news. I had news crews, cops, even the FBI all over my townhouse complex. My fiance and I met with the FBI three times. They searched our home and everything. I remember clear as day. My fiance facetimed me as the cops were digging through the trash cans directly in front of my townhouse. They pulled out her boot and a bloody knife. Then they found her body, dumped maybe 300 feet from my house. He had watched them find the murder weapon. Dumbus put it in a trash bag along with his other mail. He went to his back porch and opened his own throat. It's crazy. I had conversations with the guy. I never knew he was a psycho. This all happened a year ago. The kidnapping of Colleen Stan. She was hitchhiking in the 70s and turned down rides because they didn't seem safe. A van with a young couple and a baby offered her a ride and because it was a for mother-in-law e, she accepted. They held her at gunpoint, put a giant box on her head that blocked out noise and sound, and later, kept her in box the size of a coffin underneath their bed. She was brutally beaten and raped daily for 7 years. They also brainwashed her to believe that they were part of a mafia called the company that would kill her for mother-in-law e if she tried to escape. Eventually, the wife helped her escape and received immunity for testifying against her husband at trial. The case is known as the girl in the box. German Wings Flight 9525 Wikipedia link. The co-pilot locked himself in the cockpit and set the airplane for a slow descent into the French Alps. For 10 minutes, the crew desperately tried to get back into the cockpit. But in this post 9-11 world, the door was designed to withstand assault did not fail. This is was a daytime flight. Passengers knew what was happening. They could see the mountains getting closer out the windows. This wasn't a quick. What's that? Oh my god. Out. This was a long. Drawn out realization of what was coming 
and the end was inevitable. Chilling. One of my best friends growing up had an aunt that was the sweetest, most generous woman you could possibly know. She started dating a man that fell in love with her because of how sweet and kind she was. After month or so of being together, he accused her of being too nice to other people. So he bludgeoned her until she was unconscious and cut her heart out of her chest while she was still alive. He thought that it was the worst example of sheer disrespect that she would exhibit kindness towards other people when she was in a committed relationship. He believed he owned all of the good she had to give and by being nice to people that weren't him, she may as well have been cheating with the whole town. He killed her for being the person he knew her to be when they started dating. The fact people like him exist is terrifying to me. A good friend died of a brain aneurysm. One of the hardest working and smartest people I've known. She got a vet degree, got married and had a kid and 3 months later her husband found her unconscious on the floor when he got home. She never woke up. As a father of two I think about that a lot. The story of Christopher Dunchak a doctor death who operated out of the Plano and Dallas area. He maimed 33 people and killed two. He was an alleged neurosurgeon that didn't actually receive a proper medical education to operate, but still did so despite not fully being trained. No hospital would report him or take his license away. They would just pass him off to another hospital to continue injuring or killing people. He was the first doctor to be formally indicated with murder and sentenced to life imprisonment. A woman who went to my regular pub was out with her friend during the day and in the evening she missed a bus home and ended up in another pub. She was tipsy and ended up going home with a man who lived with another male. They both had an obsession with serial killers and murdered her and after they killed her they chopped her body up. They spent the next week putting her body in plastic bags and hiding them in bushes etc. They were caught pretty quickly and thankfully are in prison for life. The day she went missing I saw her in the pub with her friend and stood in the smoking area with her laughing about a pigeon who was chilling too. I have a video where she is in it and she makes a joke just hours before her death. I think about her nearly every day. It's something that is sort of traumatizing and she did not deserve such a cruel ending to her life. This story definitely isn't the scariest in these comments. But, another woman fell in love with my great grandfather, and he was already married to my great grandmother, so she came to their home with a gun, while he was at work. When my great grandmother opened the door, she shot her point blank. However, my grandmother, then three ish years old, was behind her, watching everything. I guess she concluded that she wouldn't remember, or wouldn't be believed, or simply couldn't shoot her child. Being a mother herself, and thankfully didn't shoot her. This was around 1930. Forensics weren't very advanced. No evidence was left the case goes cold. Life continued on and eventually the woman, named Lorraine, got what she wanted. She convinced my great grandfather to marry her. She had two children from a previous marriage, both older than my grandmother. I don't know what happened to her first husband. Honestly, she told everyone exactly who murdered her mother. But no one believed her. Who would believe a kid who obviously misses her mother and is having trouble adjusting to her new for mother in law -y. People just thought she demonized her stepmother for replacing her mom. Or maybe imagined it. It's an easy conclusion to reach. Honestly. And so years and years pass. She grows up with her mother's murderer in her own house. Sleeping rooms away. And Lore knows that she knows. She appears like the perfect housewife swooping in and caring for the grieving father and child. My grandmother grows up tormented by her and her children. There was obvious favoritism. The stepkids are spoiled and she's the black sheep of the for mother in law -y. She moves out and marries my grandfather the first chance she gets. She moves on and has children of her own. Five boys. Lorraine became ill and finally landed on her death. And there, she finally confessed to the truth and told everyone what she had done. I guess she was worried about the state of her soul. 57 years had passed since the murder. 16 since my great grandfather had passed. He never knew the truth. No documents were ever officially amended to state that she was the murderer. As far as I know, the authorities consider the case cold. Still, 
Almost 100 years later, it drives me nuts that my grandmother always knew. And even after she was an adult, people just said oh, you had an active imagination as a child. There's no way to live with that knowledge for so long and have no one in the world on your side. Your whole for mother-in-law against you. That's what scares me. Personal story. When I was 10, I regularly attended a choir club for kids. One day, I was picked up by my dad to drive me home. I was confused about it, as it was always my mum who did, but did not think much on it until halfway through the drive. My dad began to mumble about how sorry he was, and how I would never see him again. More than a bit frightened and confused at that point. I kept asking what he meant, but he wouldn't say, until we were home. But he did not leave the car, and instead urged me to get out. Finally, he told me I would not see him again, because he will be dead very soon for what he did, and that the police would answer me. After he practically kicked me out of the car I rushed home. But no one was there, but I found the door open, and a puddle of blood on the floor. The police was nearby, and explained what had happened. My dad was obsessively jealous and had found a pack of old condoms in the cupboard. So he drew the conclusion that my mum must have cheated on him. Never mind the fact that we only recently moved into this apartment and they could have been left by previous tenants. Or the fact that he controlled my mum's very step and never let her go anywhere alone. The police took me to the hospital where my mum, luckily alive, was being treated. My dad had smashed her skull in with a full wine bottle. The only reason she survived was because my little brother, seven at the time, intervened. If it weren't for him, my dad would have killed my mum in a fit of jealousy. When he said that I would not see him again, he meant that he had planned on killing himself shortly. After dropping me off, he did not succeed, and police managed to get him into a mental ward. This, to this date, is the scariest thing that had ever happened to me, but I keep thinking of my brother all the time. To witness your own mum being beaten half dead by your dad. We both suffered extreme mental trauma from this event later down the line, but somehow turned into decent people. I never really told him how grateful I'm he was there, but I think that I really, really should. Edit despite what my mum went through, she is the most cheerful and sweetest woman I have ever known. It takes real strength to come out of such an abusive marriage and continue to live your life in such a positive way and also raise her two children alone. My brother was a police officer. He had a call to check on the welfare of a mother who had not showed up for work. She had died on the sofa and her little toddler brought a little diaper pad and laid down next to her and died of dehydration. The little kid had opened the lower cabinets and drawers in the kitchen looking for food. He still cries about it, and he's not the crying kind. Either something very, very some mother in law happened in my town, or else we are thinking of the same person. I remember when it happened. I had my three-year-old goddaughter show me that she could open the fridge and her mother placed drinks and easily opened snacks in a bottom cupboard. 